it's very exciting you're all here. Welcome. I'm Victoria Hull. I'm um, part of the Idler. I organize the events and the online courses. Lovely to see so many of you. Hello. Hi. Yeah, do unmute for a moment and say hi. Shout hi. out. All right. Hello. I can see Chris. Hello. Hello. Hi there. Hi. Oh, welcome. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. 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 We've got 10 pages of I've lovely got my drink. people. Hi. <laughs> Oh, friends. So we're going to start quite quickly. For those of you who are new, um, we started these online drinks, a drink for the idler at the beginning of lockdown, when um, we thought it would be fun to do Zoom, but we didn't realize that everybody else was going to have to work on Zoom at the time. But they've remained a sort of really good fun um, pub-like drink. And we, I think we did them for, I think we did about 19 before we took an idle break over August and we're back here. This is the first one of a new season and we've got lots of exciting speakers coming up. And today's is our most glamorous and most intellectual probably combined, the actress Hayley Atwell. <laughs> so uh, say hi, Hayley. Hi, hello hi. everyone. It's so great, I get to snoop around in other people's houses. Yes, that's one of the part of the fun things. So, Tom Hodgkinson, our editor, is here. Say hi. And he's going to introduce Hayley in a minute. And um, uh, we also have our in-house philosopher, the great Mark Vernon, who lots of you know and love. And we are so looking forward to Mark giving <clears throat> us some of his wisdom after a month without it. We, feel, we felt quite bereft. So pretty quickly, I'm going to be handing straight over to Mark. Um, I'm just going to go through a couple of little housekeeping things with you. Um, in a minute, would you all mute yourselves and keep yourselves muted while the speakers are talking, our special guests are talking. If you've got a question for one of them, would you um, open your chat on the side and um, send me, Victoria Hull, a direct message? And I'll line up a few of your questions at the end and at about 20 to seven, we'll have a Q and A um, and some of you will have a chance to ask Hayley, Mark and Tom questions. And we'll be winding up quite promptly at seven o'clock and Tom's chosen a song for us all to sing along to. And then we will leave the meeting open for you to chat with your friends. Um, um, the speakers will vanish off. So uh, welcome all, I think that's about it. So lovely to see you after our month off. And um, Mark, how's your August been? Well, it feels it's already autumnal and September, in fact. Uh, it feels suddenly over the weekend, it all went. And there was that final burst of uh, sunshine here in London anyway. Um, and I thought I'd actually kick off the new season by invoking William Blake and actually reading a Blake poem. Um, Blake felt like one of the unsung stars of the first run of Idler Drinks. Um, and so I thought we could um, bring him back straight away. And um, his poem, To Autumn, actually, um, because it, it, for me, it, it also captures quite a lot of what might be going on for people now, at least I hope so, and help to give it voice. Um, so the poem, it starts off actually by autumn singing of the year so far. So starting off with the kind of hope of spring and then the passage of summer um, before the fruit of the year, which is both a kind of ending, but also the possibility of new beginnings. And it felt quite appropriate in this COVID year where it started with all the usual hopes of the year and then suddenly became very different over the passage of the summer. And now I don't know how other people feel, but to me, it feels like we're all kind of assessing this thing's still going on, but it's different. What does it mean? What have we learned? What is going to be the same? Um, and I hope that this poem by Blake called Two Autumn might capture some of that. So let me read it through and see what you make of it. Just, or just one more thing I wanted to say actually, was always remember with Blake, um, the seasons and the world around us are quite as much alive as you and I. And they have a consciousness, they have a sense of vitality which is active. And so I think part of the reason why it's called Two Autumn is that it's trying to invoke the season um, to become part of what's happening in the seasonal change as well as what's happening with us. And so that 
extra energy around us, if you like, can help us at this time of year and make sense of it. Um, so he's really calling on autumn to help at this time of year, um, which is, I hope, part of what it can help with our, our new Idler Drinks run. Anyway, look, here's the poem, To Autumn by William Blake. O oh, autumn, laden with fruit and stained with the blood of the grape, pass not but sit beneath my shady roof. There thou mayest rest and tune thy jolly voice to my fresh pipe, and all the daughters of the year shall dance. Sing now the lusty song of fruits and flowers. And Autumn sings. The narrow bud opens her beauties to the sun, and love runs in her thrilling veins. Blossoms hang round the brows of morning, and flourish down the bright cheek of modest eve till clustering summer breaks forth into singing and feathered clouds strew flowers around her head the spirits of the air live on the smells of fruit and joy with pinions light roves round the gardens or sits singing in the trees Thus sang the jolly autumn as he sat, then rose, girded himself, and o'er the bleak hills fled from our sight, but left his golden load. So, I don't know, September felt to me quite like that. Um, we've had um, the spring with the fruits, we've had the summer and the feathered clouds, and now autumn's sitting around us, um, tuning in with our pipe, if you like, um, but we know that he's going to flee too over the hills, um, but for now we have something of um, his golden life um, mm -hmm. to draw on. So, you know, this time is an ending, but it's also the struggle to find a new beginning. Um, I've got friends who are debating heavily whether or not to send their children back to school. Um, you know, on the one hand, of course, it's good, um, necessary for their kids, but they're worried uh, maybe they've got vulnerable people in their own household or they themselves. Um, it's a time of struggling transition. And maybe the same is true for work for you. You know, you're being called to go back to work, but don't want to. Um, maybe there's not work to go back to. Um, then there's this question of how is all this really going to change work anyway? Um, you know, central London's feeling permanently different. I mean, it feels that even were this crisis to end tomorrow, it somehow would be very, very different. Um, and perhaps, you know, life itself um, is brought some changes. Maybe you felt death coming that little bit nearer. Maybe death has come right into your household. Um, and, you know, what does that mean? What is, as it were, the fruit of the summer that autumn might be calling us to really take in and to draw from? Um, the longer lasting lessons, if you like, um, of this time of year. A lot of those questions feel to me like they're round and about. Um, I'm not going to pretend to be able to answer them, but I think what Autumn does bring, as I was suggesting with Blake, um, is it brings a kind of energy, if we can tune into the light, you know, the low sun, that actually is in a way much friendlier than the summer sun that is as likely to burn us and make us feel sort of blasted um, as it is to really feed us. These low, the low sun of the, the shorter evenings can be rather wonderful um, as well as helping us to close in on ourselves a bit and try and take in the lessons of the year. Um, there is the fruiting of the year as well. Um, you know, we're aware of life in a different way. I'm, I'm reading Merlin Sheldrake's wonderful book called Entangled Life. Um, and Merlin has written in the new Idler as well, The Magic of Mushrooms, um, the new Idler magazine out this week, little plug. Um, but it's, it's a tremendous book because um, what he's saying is, pay attention to this fruiting life around you and it will actually open up all sorts of new life forms, new ways of being in the world um, that imaginatively provoke us to question and to reconsider our own life as well. That's part of the joy of this time of year. Um, so autumn, you know, has things to help for us. And, and with Blake, struggle and even despair crisis is always a turning point because what Blake realizes is that if we can tolerate and bear what feels difficult it can become a threshold and a doorway that opens up into new life and new possibilities. Um, it's not easy, it's not straightforward but if we can think and approach this season 
which itself is turning into a new kind of energy, a new life, the life of winter, um, rather than just wanting to return to the summer, rather than just wanting things to get back to as they were earlier in life, as it were, um, then actually more life can become possible, can open up to us. And um, so I hope that might resonate with some of where you're at. I certainly believe powerfully in evoking William Blake. He's been a bit of a guiding light for our idler drinks. I think we love him here at the idler. Um, he wants us to feel there's life around and about. It's not just us stuck in our own lives. And autumn has its own quality of life, which can feel like an ending, but it's also a new beginning. Tom. Well, that's a wonderfully, Mark, thanks so much. That's, that's actually a beautiful thought because Victoria and I actually got back from holiday this morning uh, from Puglia in southern Italy um, and uh, walked out onto Uxbridge Road and just, uh, I guess, felt assaulted by the, you know, <laughs> the gloom of London. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's a lovely thought. And I can see lots of people are enjoying that thought um, down in the, in the chat room. And I can see we have, we've got people from all over the place, from Brazil, loads of people from the States. So thanks so much for coming along um, uh, to be with us for our chat with Hayley Atwell. Now, Hayley, could you just give us a big wave and say hi? Hello, welcome. <laughs> and you're in a lovely room. Now, tell us about your room because you've been doing, that's kind of like your own work, isn't it? Yeah, so we're at the top of my hat. This is where I do all my idling up here. This is my decoupage screen. So this is actually, and this this here, that's William Blake, just there. So oh. like great app, so thanks for that, Mark. Just time that <laughs> And also I noticed, I have a snail on my wallpaper on this tree. Oh. It, I mean, I it's, it's, I've got idle, idler coming out of the, the walls of my house. Actually, um, keeping through the walls. Yeah, this is um, th this is one of the things I've taken up. I, as I said to you before, Tom, I'm I'm by nature rubbish at idling. Usually, um, I'm quite. I used to say I was quite restless and impatient. I think I, actually I was just always very curious and adventurous and inquisitive. And similar to what Mark was saying, you know, about the we can look at. There are so many different ways to look at uh, philosophically. Um, this kind of reckoning that's happened and this absolute crisis that's happened and taking into consideration the you know the unbelievable devastation of what's happened and then also going with that also comes other opportunities for change that could be seen in a in a positive light or at least for me it has to be because i have to i'm i'm an optimist by nature and i believe that hope is such a powerful important thing to have so you know, thinking about this time of just going, how can I be my creative, full expression of my creative self as an actor who can't quite, who's, who's not allowed to act. And I, so I took to a bit of marbling, decoupage, collaging. I got out all my shoe boxes that were in my basement of postcards I've picked up and press night cards from plays I've done. And we've got David Bowie down here. I just saw David Bowie down the corner. Is that in his um, uh, labyrinth phase? Paris. That's Jareth. It's yeah. my beloved Jareth. And then we have, I also got a, a life-size cutout of, day, of uh, Freddie Mercury. I found that when I was in lockdown, I really wanted like bold personalities in my house. That sense of just that made me feel like vivid and alive and excited because of so much devastation and, and grief happening and fear of the unknown. And how, and how have your days been in your house? Because, I mean, I know when we interviewed you a couple of years ago for um, The Idler, and there it is, that's the cover that we thought we were like, yeah, we won't do a sort of like boring, you know, glamorous photo. We'll, we'll do some sort of arty picture. Um, but you now say you would have much preferred the sort of like hot pictures that were inside. It's, um, but do you feel like it's part of the human condition? You know, I spend years going, I just want to be taken seriously as an artist. And then the minute I'm put on like a demure, lovely quite conservative cover i'm like objectify me i want to look, <laughs> I want to look hot <laughs> you just can't win at the idler yeah it's, it's very it's very difficult but um next time we'll, we'll do the well you, you can be hot and philosophical can't you you can you can, absolutely can be yeah, All the yeah, which you're demonstrating right now you know um fantastically well um but what, during lockdown uh, let's just rewind to march your um your latest you know, really big job is that you're going to be in the Mission Impossible films. Mm. Um, 
Now, how, how was that going just before lockdown and, and how has it been since? And, and you know, have you had a, a bit of time to, you know, be idle in lockdown or has it been all Zoom meetings? It's, um, it's been many, many shades of lockdown, I think with the different stages of it that everyone has probably experienced, like the lethargy and then maybe a burst of creative inspiration followed by, followed by just devastation or frustration or, you know, all the, all the colours that come with it. But I started training for mission in September and I was doing mixed martial arts. I was studying knife training. I was doing 10K runs in Richmond Park and doing conditioning and Pilates and... Um, I was working with an Olympic master called Wolfgang, who was a six foot four um, expert in mixed martial arts, who was the kindest, most zen-like man I've ever met. And um, so we've been training and we've been doing production meetings, getting the script ready. And when I came on board with Mission, they said, we don't, we don't have a character, we don't have a script. We want, we're trying to find an actor that we want to work with, that we feel has good chemistry with Tom, that likes the fact that we kind of make That's it up. Tom, Tom. That's a to it's a actor called Tom Cruise. You might have heard of him. Oh, Tom Cruise. He's yeah. a new kid about town. He's 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 got potential. So, so hang on, they 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 guess what? They they're changing the whole film uh, for you. <laughs> they were like, we we don't have a script, so we want an actor who's fine with that. Is basically <laughs> what the kind of the premise was of the screen test. And they said, you know, if you, if you and Tom get on, if you have a natural rapport, if you can enjoy the fact that we just throw out lots of ideas and see what sticks and, and what lands. And that if we have a script, that's great. But if we are um, always trying to chase the feeling of what will excite the audience in the moment, then we're gonna go off script. And if that's something as an actor you like, then Mission Impossible might be for you. So um, luckily I also, was able to pass the physical training or whatever. They chose me anyway. So I've been doing some training and having just this incredible time with a very, um, you know, a big machine of a franchise that's so uh, forward driven and, and active. And we went to Venice and four days, I think before we started sh shooting, we all got sent home again for lockdown. And I remember the director, McHugh. Why, why, was, why was Venice, you were going to be actually filming scenes in Venice? Yeah, yeah. yeah doing fight sequences and light shoots in Venice. We'd start there and we're still going. We're, good. we're doing it in a couple of weeks now. So um, it was all starting to kind of close down and we were just sort of sat there in the hotel going, and the director was going, welcome to Mission. And I was like, isn't this also the plot of Mission 2? Isn't there sort of a, a virus that's like creates world devastation? <laughs> <It all laughs> felt weirdly connected, and, uh, you know, life imitating art. And so we got sent home and I took up marbling and decoupage and um, all my training went onto Zoom as it is for most people in their work environment. And we would do production meetings and script meetings. And, and in a way, what was kind of, was very sweet is everyone became very human sized all of a sudden. Like we, Tom and I would be on Zoom and every so often we'd have a technical glitch and suddenly Tom would be like frozen in this sort of, position and I'd be like oh this is really awkward but kind of great because now I'm not kind of you know intimidated by this it feels almost like the curtain behind this huge Hollywood machine has been pulled back and it's just a lot of people figuring out how the hell they get through a pandemic and I started with the voice yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. well come on what's your what's uh, what's he like oh he he is heaven he's um he is it's like having a life coach in, in a boxing ring, just going, you can do it. And his positive, you see, you think, you know, I've spent a lot of time with him now and you think it's gonna drop at some point or the mask, it's, it's all a facade. But his commitment to creating a work environment where every single person thrives and his sincerity it is in his consistency in that. There's like a wholesomeness about him. Like he, he, he often, he just he loves movies he talks about movies non-stop but it's all for the love of the audience he's 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 kind of like a kid that's just got this boundless amount of energy and you know there's a difference between you know when people go like oh you know i really wish you well like great job and him going what can i do to make it easier more exciting for you what what is something that you want to try you want to do knives you want to do really so, so it's like a sort of he's like a sort of an amazing um sort of people manager. Actually, I remember you saying that about Emma Thompson, 
Yeah. And there are these people in your business who just sort of, you know, there's a reason why they're so successful actually, is that they're, they're very sort of generous spirited people and they make people feel really good around them. It yes. sounds like he's one of those. I remember you saying that that was certainly true of Emma Thompson. I, I felt that um, this might be a generalization, but the more successful the person, in my industry anyway, um, the kinder uh, they are and the more um, down to earth they are. Because, you know, the, one of the parts of people's success is because people want to work with them. And, you know, you want to work with people who, you, who also feel to see you. And I feel that Tom, sees people he knows everyone's name he knows their partner's names he knows when it's their birthday he checks in with people if, if he senses that someone's confused or unclear about something he'll 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 want to get involved to find out how to make that job better for that person he takes an interest in hair the makeup the costume the lighting department the, you know the, the focus puller the the rigging the locations um you know one thing that he's done in the pandemic is when we all went to zoom he it was really important to him that because he knew how so many so many people were involved in the making of mission and so many people's livelihoods were at stake with with closing down that he kept, he was keeping heads of department alive by having everything on zoom and having meetings generating and people still working as much as they could in a remote way so that people still had a livelihood and he was also creating a sense of morale and um as this sort of team leader and it the the and at the same time not being sort of polyam pollyanna kind of overly optimistic in a sort of unrealistic way he just had this like it's a hero quality that he plays in, in a lot of his films which is we're going to get we're going to get we're going to do what needs to be done and we're going to make sure everyone's okay in the process and so there's a sort of you know i'm under no illusions that i feel i'm in a very lucky position that a lot of my morale in lockdown was kept up from having a team leader like Tom, who is wow. as generous as he is with everyone. Yeah. You know, it's it's across the board. Now, um, your parents are quite weird, aren't they, Haley? <laughs> How do you, you and, and they're quite sort of new agey and um, your mum's very sort of self-healthy, but your dad is it's like a sort of a, some sort of guru, I think. Um, <laughs> can you just sort of, <laughs> you just put that in your own words? I probably caricatured them in a horrible way. I, no, I probably have probably get in trouble for having said all that before. Um, my, so well, my, my, my dad's in California and um, say that they were, they were quite, they're artistic and kind of soul searchers. They weren't, they, they're top idlers. They're full on idler philosophy in life. They don't kind of want to buy into the trappings of the nine to five job or feeling that, that you know, the pursuit of ambition or social status is going to give you anything other than more grief um and insecurity so you know they they always i think offered me the possibility of looking around the corner at the kind of mainstream or what society said life is and should be and what you should expect of yourself and expect of what life wants from you and they just were like well what about if you go around this corner you could see a different view and a different perspective so they were always trying to kind of do that really but my dad in california has been making these has been collecting crystals can you see this I'm putting little figurines on top of them. Yeah, so what? So that's like a sort of a blue crystal, there, is it? The blue crystal with a like a surfer dude and a pair of pants, or it also might be a nude coloured turtleneck. I can't really tell. <laughs> um, with like a dried rose petal on the side. So he's been he's been doing his own little art projects, and I think that's been keeping him going. So, so I mean, it's, the father and daughter have actually been doing. You know, you just like given all this time, you start doing this. Um, well, I'm not going to comment on the quality, but artworks. There's no such thing as, as when it comes to art and self-expression. Good or bad. In, in lockdown, there's, there's no high-low, there's no hierarchy here. No, no. It's art for art's sake. It's art for art's sake, it's lockdown art, and we're not going to make any judgments on its quality either way. We're not going to, because we don't no. do that. We're not judgmental, small-minded people, are we, Tom? Um, <laughs> now, what about your mother? Uh, has she been creative too yeah so so very luckily my family have been touch wood healthy so um and not at high risk so my mum got involved with this thing called on hand which is uh, i've talked about it before it's an app where you sign up for it and then it, it sends you alerts of who in your local area need help whether that's drop-offs or outreach calls of you know um uh, like delivering groceries or medic medical supplies 
And so she's been doing that. And I got involved as well because it's such a, it's, it was been such a kind of a grassroots, how can I actually help people in, in my community and get yeah, to Immediately, in, yeah, yeah, you could sort of actually do something rather than sort of giving money to an enormous charity. You don't really know what's happened to it. Yes, exactly. And then kind of shouting at the television um, or the newspapers. It would go, it was, I was seeing kind of bursts of altruism and acts of kindness in the street. And I felt that that for me was the overpowering sense that I got in lockdown from human to human contact. We kind of the irony of going, we're all in our houses and yet weirdly I feel more connected to a lot more people because I think there's a shared vulnerability um, and that's, that's very humane that's happening. That, that, that shared sort of sense of fear and not knowing means a lot of things falling away. And so with my mum going off and doing all of these things, it inspired me to, to you know, I, I, I do these outreach calls and I remember kind of getting a call saying, you know, Hollywood wants to zoom and I was like Hollywood can wait Barry from <laughs> needs a check-in Barry oh. can... and it was um you know so th those you know those things I think have been a real eye-opener for me that actually that my my it has restored my my faith in the just the common decency of people to take care of themselves in a crisis and the resilience yeah, that's true that. people have been sort of you know just, just sort of naturally um kind uh, and sort of helping each other. Um, in, in most cases, not in all cases, uh, my mother's not really been like that. Um, <laughs> she says, I don't want to hear, she says, uh, people, people say they love hearing the bird song. I don't want to hear bird song. I want to hear aeroplanes going overhead. We're going backwards. We're going back to the Middle Ages. Um, but I don't know whether that's uh, co a common reaction, uh, whether she's just being perverse. But it sounds like your parents have sort of looked on the bright side a little bit more. Well, I just, I wonder this, I tell you what I think is perverse, is I kind of, I'm at my happiest, not the happiest, but I'm, I'm, I, I've learned that I'm quite capable in an emergency. It's when the stakes aren't really high in my life that I seem to fall apart. I'll stub my toe and lose my shit. But if there's something serious happening, I'm on it and I'm there and I can, I know what to do. And instinctively I go, I put one foot in the other. I feel like that might be something part of the human condition that I kind of, you know, not having anything to do and be of use or living with life of purpose outside of my head makes me really um, irritable and um, kind of depressed actually. And, 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 and internalizing everything and overthinking and overanalyzing. That was an important thing in, in lockdown for me is that I know that my nature is that I have this sort of, if I start to wallow or self-indulge or create my own pity party, that's fine for a bit if it needs to happen for a second. But if that becomes kind of my default position, it becomes a really hard to get out of that over time because it becomes the norm and then the misery breeds company and we're all talking about how shit everything is. But the other thing is like, I know that I have a natural tendency to want to do those things unless I'm actively doing the opposite, which is following my passion and connecting with other people and finding ways to get outside of my own head. And then, then I go, oh, my, my life falls into perspective and I become human sized. And so that's one of those things, kind of moment of reckoning in lockdown. Like I think most people have had moments of just like, I'm overwhelmed, I can't get off my couch. This is really hard. And, and I think if that wasn't the case, I'd probably be a bit of a sociopath. <laughs> if I didn't have those days where I was going, this is hard, this is painful, this is frustrating, I'm so angry, I'm confused, I'm lost, I'm bored, I'm tired, I'm hungry. All those things. Um, and they have their place. And I think they're also a normal reaction to the given circumstance. They're a healthy human reaction. So, you know, I'm not kind of advocating that I'm this kind of superhero that I'm like, I'm so creative and having this great old time. But I know that I can feel more engaged with life on life's terms if I'm off my couch, out of my own pity party, and I'm doing something for someone else that needs, needs, needs my help. And then you kind of, kind of go, well, it's a kind of a, that's where the joy is as well. If you feel you're contributing something, I suppose, in, what, in whatever way it is. Yeah, exactly. And also I have, I have three rescue pets in this house. 
I have two, um, two dogs, two French bulldogs, and um, one of them, Iris, is so judgy. She has me check. She, she has this look, like she has that kind of classic look of I want to speak to the manager, but also that look where she's always, she's like, is that, is that how you're going to parent me today? Is that, are you happy with the choice there, the attempt to discipline me? And so she kind of gives me this reality check of going, you're, you're not doing as well as you think, just to let you know. I remember I, I had that sort of, in early lockdown, I had the moment of hysteria of going, I've got to create a vegetable patch in my garden. And so got all my bits, planted it, felt very green fingered and felt very excited for myself. And then within half an hour, she was sat in the middle of it. And she looked at me like, bitch, you live within walking distance of a fully stocked supermarket. <laughs> Is middle class hysteria. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I like after a few weeks I got a couple of spring onions out of it and I was like oh this is, this okay. is not so, do, do you think the dog was actually thinking that or do you think that might have been you sort of projecting into the dog's head 100% projection that's why I have the dogs so I could project different yeah. parts different archetypes of my like own have you seen Nina Conti's monkey sorry Nina Conti's monkey oh, what, she, she, what's she's that hilarious she, she's a, a, a ventriloquist and she has this monkey he says the truth Yes, yes. Like, like, like she's with her dad and the, the monkey goes, you're an alcoholic and whatever. Completely. So Iris is the one of going, bitch, you ain't all that. And then I've got Wolfie, who I named after my stunt guy, uh, who, is, who is also another, I guess, another part of my personality. Wolfie's, um, he looks like he knows exactly what's going on. He looks a bit like Winston Churchill and, and a general. He's like, hello, all good. You know, he's got quite a stern, confident expression. But with all due respect to Wolfie, he's really stupid. So he doesn't know what is going on at any given moment. <laughs> and, but he walks around like, no, everything's fine. Everything's good. Yeah, absolutely. And then you'll kind of go, Wolfie, and you'll go, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> And I also think that's another part of my personality as well. And then I have a cat, Sailor, which, because, you know, lockdown. Okay, well, we, we were going to meet Sailor, weren't we? we? We had a chat beforehand and you thought you might be able to get a Sailor. Is that still, is that still on? Sailor, she does what she wants. I can call her, but, I <laughs> I can, but I'll have to disappear and go and get her, which I'll probably, you'll know, see the back of the door for 20 minutes. I go and try and coax yeah, maybe her. That's a bit of a, yeah, well, should, should, we, should we skip the, I mean, it would be nice to see the animals, but um, oh, Sailor, you don't want to be for such a long time. See if, she'll call, see if I have any authority over her at all. <laughs> I'm going to be undermined by a cat that doesn't even make an appearance. <laughs> Sailor! So Susan Kay has said, show us the dogs. They're not here. They're not here. Oh, the, the dogs aren't actually there, so we can't see the dogs. No, actually, they're not here. Yeah, but, but cats do, their own, do do their own thing. Um, uh, and they're quite uncaring. We, we had to drown some Kit Kats yesterday, actually. <laughs> not me personally. but um, drowned some kittens. There was, um, yeah, it's a bit, a bit of a shocking story. It, well, the place we were staying in in Italy, there were lots of wild cats, and this mother had given birth to some kittens, um, and then abandoned them. And th these kittens were sort of dying. They had, you know, things on their heads, and they were just sort of—they obviously going to die if they were left out there. So one of our number in our party, just, we, we decided it was the humane thing to actually drown them. Anyway, we'll move on from that. Sorry about that, Haley. I, I shouldn't have brought that up. Um, oh, now let's go back to our other questions. <laughs> that's, um, that was so brilliantly timed. Um, <laughs> well, I really, I really hope Sailor comes back in. That's um, like the worst thing that's yeah, happened. Someone said, Tom, that's Tom that, was, that was really uncool and I've, I've destroyed the mood. Oh, it's, 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 look, well, this is, this is now we're in what we, we it was life BC before Corona. Now yeah. after Corona, we all have to toughen up a little bit and deal with the stories of drowning, grounding, grounding kittens with things on their heads. I, I mean, I don't even know. Yeah, yeah, it was, well, it used to be quite a common thing, but you know. Um, <laughs> so, is Sailor gonna come up or no? Sailor's not responding to your, your, your calls. She's not, she's, you know, she's not. I can send you, I could show you a picture of her on my phone. I mean, oh, that is, like, yeah. I've got imaginary pets. People Some like of your her. fans down here know the name of your, names of your dogs, Howard. Yeah. Howard's doing great. He's with my my mom because he's in love with her. So he spends most of the time with her. And, and who's the other one? There's Wolfie. Right, okay. And there's Iris. And then we have my cat, 
called Sailor, who is a ragdoll who, um, oh look, here she is. She's very beautiful. Oh, can you see? Oh, she's kind of, you can't really see. It looks like she's kind of well, a picture. Yeah, I know, we just saw a bit. Saw a bit more clearly, yeah. <laughs> I, I wouldn't let you anywhere near her though, because it, you'd probably ground her. <laughs> hey look, it wasn't me, okay. And it was a humane thing. It was the only humane thing to do. They were dying. It's, um, well, well, if they're dying, you didn't say they were dying. You just said there were things on their head. Oh, right, so I didn't explain it very well. Yeah, they, 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 were, they were literally dying. I mean, they were abandoned. They weren't going to live, you know. Okay, fine. So this was the, the humane thing to do. Okay. Um, now, Christopher Robin was quite a sort of idlery film. Mm. Yes. Um, was that fun to do? It was joyful because it, you can't really do a Disney film about Winnie the Pooh and Piglet. Um, can you imagine if we were like hating each other and really rude to each other on set? <laughs> <laughs> the story about Winnie the Pooh. We, so it was a kind of, a, we'd walk on set and play with the puppets and be like, oh, 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 oh so And we all got, I think, quite philosophical. We're like, yeah, you know, it's all just about like doing nothing. Just, you know, just, just doing nothing. Oh, shit, we've got to make these pages. By the end of the day, we've got, we've got half an hour to get a scene. It's quite sometimes the first yeah, it, it was because that was that was the message of the film, wasn't it? And, um, we interviewed Simon Farnaby about it. In fact, he's going to come back to one of these. Um, mm -hmm. I think I either wrote it or co-wrote it or had something to do with the script. Um, yeah, and that was sort of a deliberate thing to sort of put in this, uh, yeah, praise of doing nothing, I guess. Yeah, it, yeah, and and well timed. You know, with such a kind of a seems to be such a, a a hunger for fast pace and aggressive and ambitious, dark or exciting, overstimulating content. That to have something like Christopher Robin, which has at its centre just a very sweet, simple message that feels very profound. Um, you know what? I think it's the Tao of Pooh and the Tay of Piglet. Looking at all those those books. Well, you've got the tale of Piglet as well. I hadn't heard of that one. Yeah, I think this Piglet has his own spin-off. Okay. He, yeah. he, she, they. I'm not sure how what the pronoun is. I don't know how they identify, but um. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's, that's a very woke comment. Um, and um, so I've just seen someone say. Jess said, "Do you get anything from the set?" And in fact, um, part of what you see here. I love making collages, so I have one um, of. Uh, Thing, props that I got from the set of Christopher Robin framed. So I have a little silver acorn. I have a little picture that Bryony, who played my daughter, uh, wrote, drew of myself with a red balloon and, and poo. Um, and then I have a happy Wednesday uh, sign on a twig and then some heather from Ashdown Forest where we originally filmed. And uh, just a little note card from Disney. It's kind of, a, I, I like to kind of, it's a way for me to commemorate the, and um, you know, honor the, the experience yeah, and do, don't you create a sort of a shrine from with little bits and bobs from these uh projects that you've worked on no i wouldn't go so as far as say a shrine a I mean, shrine okay sad, but uh i'm close um yeah i like to um it's just a kind of a well i think i'm a bit of a magpie on set i love i love props and especially if it's a period piece do you go wow the, you know, people have gone to these um you know antique shops and sourced original kind of pieces from that time and so it's like walking into a living museum that you get to inhabit and walk around it's one of the joys of being an actor and doing lots of different sorts of sorts of genres and and periods and so i'd always kind of find that often the prop master oh i'll tell you what hang on I'll say that i'll show you one thing this is an example of the prop master on agent carter the first he he clocked that i would always be like poking or picking something up or going up oh, that's really nice and at the end of the first season, he had collected together everything that he saw me kind of rummaging through and looking at in between really? the takes and put it in a cabinet. Look, I'm gonna, I'll show you. I've got it, there's one just here actually. You can see how he's got a Howard Zen poster behind the door there, I think. Homage to myself, I'm such a narcissist. Okay, um, here, look how sweet that is. There's, um, uh, uh, it's this like there's lots basically files and um but there's also a vial of captain america's blood in here i think somewhere there's dog tags hang on oh yeah here's there's there's chris evans blood everyone but hey it's not real there's a there's a gun in here should i oh, ever, no, this is too much should i ever come across some kittens that need to be put out their misery <laughs> i'm uh, 
Yeah, I don't think it must have been a better method than the one we used. <laughs> oh God! Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's just a fun way of, of you know, kind of re remembering, remembering all these experiences. You know, I, I, f I feel like I've lived in many different worlds and lives, and, and um, in stories that is so kind of want to document it a little bit. It's like a, my my living journal. Now, can we just talk about how then briefly before we go on to questions? Because there's, there's tons of questions coming in. Um, and loads of fans, Agent Carter is the best. You punched Howard Stark in face for that blood, ha ha. <laughs> um, and so on. Anyway, we'll, we'll come back to these questions in, in a second. Thanks so much everyone for them. Um, but, but very quickly, when we interviewed you for the Idol magazine, you were doing uh, just about, you just done, I think, uh, Howard's End. Mm. Which is such a, a lovely book, actually. Um, and you were one of the Schlegels, which one was it? Margaret. Margaret, yeah. And um, and I was like, yeah, they're quite sort of bohemian, but you said they're not really bohemian. They're just sort of... They're, well, they're... they're in a way. She's, she's an intellectual. You know, she's... I think the thing... Maybe it's my kind of limited understanding of what a bohemian is, but I, I, I associate kind of bohemianism with also rejection of a capitalist society that's kind of yeah. a struggling artist, that's kind of a house that's really frayed at the edges. Um, and you know, she, they, they, lived, they lived humbly, but within a, within a social class that was very privileged. And they were autodidactic and um, incredibly logical and rational and um, uh, wanting, to, wanting to create positive change in the world through social reform and um, you know, more kind of liberal, uh, democratic ideas about life outside of, I suppose, the, it's the limited world that them, they as women had been kind of given and handed. Um, so it's, so I, I would say that they were, they were, in, she's an intellectual, I'd say, more than, more than bohemian, but, but certainly would have artists and bohemians hanging out in the house, for sure. I think there's a reference to that, aren't you, me going, Always bringing home people with long hair, <laughs> musicians, and uh, you know, so yeah, the heathens uh, that probably would have would have liked the Schlegel family. I would have liked the Schlegel family. I think. I mean, I also think Emma Thompson is Margaret Schlegel. I mean, it's kind of basically absolutely who she is. Um, so yeah, I kind of studied her like a hawk. Now, should we go to some questions, Victoria? We've got absolutely millions of questions. Hey, thanks so let's... For the, 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 some beautiful stuff. I mean, I don't know if you can see the chat, but um, uh, particularly what you're saying about the sort of overthinking and lockdown is hugely appreciated by people. Um, yeah. I know they've got lots of questions. Yeah, so we're going to uh, race through some questions. If you've asked me one, be ready to unmute yourself. Um, can we crack straight on? Sarah Lau, you had a question. And just so you're ready to unmute, there's somebody called G. I'd really like you to be ready to ask a question. And Letitia Bellotti. Um, that's just for starters. And, and let's be quick, um, people, because I know there are loads of you waiting. So we've got Sarah, are you there? Hi, uh, can you see and hear me okay? Yeah. Hi. Perfect. Hi. Um, okay, so my question is, if you had to give your younger self a piece of advice, what would you say? Oh, um, I would say, I, I'd probably say, it's a simple one, it's an obvious one, but it's relax. Um, I, I, I really didn't overall like my 20s. I found it really hard and I didn't know who I was and I didn't know, I had so much sort of, the world just seemed so big and impenetrable. And I also felt like I didn't come from, um, I didn't come from a background of, of the film industry. I didn't come from, I didn't have any sort of financial security or privilege from my family. I felt like I was, if I was gonna do anything in the world, I was gonna have to be self-made and that was daunting and, um, and, you know, trying to navigate life on life's terms is really tough in, in my 20s. For me, it was, it was really crazy. And I think 
the one piece of advice I would give my younger self is, is to relax and take it a day at a time and very much in keeping with the Eidler philosophy. And it, it feels easy for me to say that because I've gotten to a place where I feel like I can. And back then I felt like I couldn't relax. And I was scared that if I let anything drop, that, you know, I was wasting time or something terrible would happen or that, you know, I, I you know, that there was, I had to kind of be on uh, this kind of rat race hamster wheel um, because everyone was sort of descending on London to, for their, you know, for their, to kind of create a life for themselves. And, and, I, and there was this like kind of a heated competition in the industry I was in. It was just kind of overwhelming really. And I was, I, so I would say, I look back at that time and just go, it's okay. It's, yeah. it's all okay. And it will be okay. Yeah, that's a good advice. Can I just say you're a really big inspiration to me. I really look up to you. I just wanted to say that because you you really inspire me a lot. So thank you for that. Oh, Sarah, <laughs> I know that you're not the only one. I can tell from some of the questions I've been having. Gosh, Haley, you've had a big influence on a lot of people. Yeah, and I also saw you on Rasmus when I got to go to London, which was a big honor. So, oh, yeah. thank, you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's so kind. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Um, G, can you ask your question? You there, G? Yeah, hi. Um, hi. Hi. Um, so, as a gay teen, the scenes between Peggy and Angie and Agent Carter that kind of could be read as queer meant a lot to me. And I was wondering if this was like intentional and if anything would have happened if the show had been renewed for season three. Oh, I would have loved that to have happened. I think now it would. I think, Yeah. I don't think you can make that show with with Angie and Peggy with not addressing that because part of part of the joy of making it was as it was coming out and members of the queer community were going oh could this be what this what is this and we and and so we were going like oh well it's not, it wasn't written on the page but I'm also like Lindsay and I have got great chemistry fantastic let's run with this and be like yes yeah, so we actually always intended it to be this way um but I think I think you know, now, it, 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 Hollywood takes a long time to catch up to what's happening culturally. Uh, the, and I say Hollywood, I mean the mainstream. And so um, it, it, it feels like in 2020, it's, it would have to, it would have to include that. It would have to include things. I think, you know, something like Marvel that appeals to mm -hmm. so, such a big demographic, it cannot... Um, it, it cannot ignore the impact it has. When you think about, you know, sadly with, with Chadwick Roseman passing yeah. away, his legacy of Black Panther, culturally what that meant, not just as a, a fantasy superhero character, but as a black man at the center of a superhero franchise that grossed over a billion, that now said there's no reason why a black man or woman should not be at the center of a huge franchise like this because it proves that people go to those audiences, they, they go, the audiences are there and they want mm -hmm. them. So I think when it comes to, you know, Marvel's kind of inclusivity and its, its desire to sort of reflect heroes for the times, it would absolutely have to bring in um, a, a more queer element to some of the relationships, uh, whether that becomes more fluid or it becomes more um, pansexual or whatever, or, or, or labeled or not labeled. But it, I, think it, mm -hmm. I think art is there to reflect how the world is. And that's the beauty of it. And that's, it should be a celebration of the entire spectrum of, of human expression and sexuality and identity. So, uh, hey, if, if that ever came out, I'd be like, we need that, we need that then. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, that really means a lot to me. Yeah. <laughs> Great, thank you. Can we, um, could Letitia, Ask her question, please. You've got several, but could you ask one? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Hi. Well, I'm from Brazil, and I have a question about Mission Impossible. Yeah. Uh, what was your inspiration to play a role in Mission Impossible? Um, well, it, the main thing was when I went in for the screen test with Christopher McQuarrie, who's the director, and also Tom Cruise, who I'd met at screen tests previously before, and had friends of mine who'd worked with him that absolutely loved him. What I felt was, I don't, I don't know what this character is yet because there's no script. I just want to work with these people. And I felt fully seen. I felt that they were like 
they wanted to collaborate. Tom would ask me my opinion on things. But what is it you want to do? How, how do you see a leading lady in Mission Impossible that feels different to what we've seen before? And, this, and Christopher McQuarrie would say the same things. We'd, we'd watch movies together and then we'd review them together. And it just felt like it was a true collaborative spirit. And I felt so safe. And I didn't, I felt as a, you know, and, and here's the other thing that I felt that Tom and McHugh do brilliantly is they love strong women and they love intelligent women and opinionated women and feeling centered women. And um, that helped that create an environment where I felt that I could really be myself. And so what's happened remarkably, we haven't shot it yet, so it could all change. So don't hold me to this, but in the last, I've now been working with them for a year, they're creating a character based on the qualities that they see me as a person, as a human being, for my messiness and my vulnerability as much as my competence with a set of knives. And what I want to bring to Mission Impossible is a modern day heroine that is, um, that is the opposite of what we've seen before, which is, in these action franchises, they tend to be the woman is flawless. She's the expert and she's impenetrable apart from when she's being penetrated. But there is this sort of like, this kind of hard kind of perfection coolness about her. And I was like, wouldn't it be great if she was a klutz? If she didn't know what she was doing, if she was kind of sometimes making up as she went along and then going, I don't know how I pulled that off. I was like, because I relate to that. That feels more something I can get behind. So, um, so you know, going back to it, it's it, like a lot of the stuff that I've done and what I would always hope that if I'm lucky enough to strive for is working with filmmakers and people that inspire me and that feel like are oh, really wanting to reflect uh, women as we are today and what audiences want. And, and so for me, it was Tom and McHugh did that. Amazing. Thank you so much. I am Best of Haley on Instagram and you are such an inspiration for me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Lovely. Um, could we have Madam Spellman and then Ben Moore, please? Ben Moore! <laughs> Hi, Haley. Um, I just want to say that I love you so much and my question for you is, do you have a favourite era of classic Hollywood or a classic Hollywood actress that you look up to? Oh God, that, yeah, the golden age. I watched, um, <sighs> I love Catherine Hepburn and Bringing Up Baby. I watched that again recently. I, I loved her sort of, just the, and, and, and you know, of course, Betty Davis and, um, you know, these powerhouse women that were just, that also could do screwball. And Lucille Ball, I've just kind of re like discovered uh, again mm -hmm. um, that kind of sort of playful clown. Um, and I think it's not so much the kind of an era of Hollywood in terms of the time or the aesthetic, which is entirely, I think, um, a reflection of the times and the politics of the times, but the the kind of archetypal women that um, that we have today, but that we had that back then is that classic sort of. The, the, the leading lady who's also the screwball, who's also vulnerable and she's messy and she's endearing because of all the things that, that make her imperfect. Um, I also watched recently uh, Barbara Streisand and What's Up Doc again and the charm coming out of that woman. She, I'm, <laughs> what I loved is that she's, she's com completely oblivious to the carnage she's creating behind her and, and the chaos and yet she's just entirely lovable and i i think that's just for me that's kind of my my favorite kind of hollywood heroine um god yeah so 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 many but you know i'd, I'd say at the moment lucille ball is my is my go-to gal she's also a great person to to be watching in lockdown because she's so silly and i think getting in touch with our inner it, getting me getting in touch with my inner silly is like the best way to let off steam in lockdown for sure Thank you so much, and I love you so much. Thank you for inspiring me. Oh, can we quickly um, have Ben? Ben, and then we've got a question from Alana, and hopefully we've got time for Ellie Hopkinson as well. Ben, are you there? Hi. Am I, am I unmuted? I don't know. 
Hi. <laughs> oh, hello, Haley. Um, well, it was just, a, it was a, you're going to love Ven Venice is amazing. You can have a great time. Um, the only question I had is there's lots of downtime on a movie set and also in a theatre dressing room sometimes. So, you know, um, lots of actors play games, do crosswords, read books. What's your idling hobby on location? Um, I have I have different ones for different moods. So um, Bananagrams and Doggle are the go-to games because they're quick. They kind of keep you engaged, but they're not too manic. And you can do like five or six of them. You can do them really, really quickly. So with, with a set, as you know, that feeling of like, you have to go from zero to a hundred. Suddenly I, I'm not doing anything for an hour. And they're like, oh my God, I've got the emotional seat right now. <laughs> we're, we're suddenly ready. So Bananagrams and Doggle are great for that. Um, the other thing I love to do, I love a prank. I love like a long drawn out prank. So just kind of working out what I can do that doesn't disrupt anyone in a destructive way that's going to come and bite me on the bum afterwards, but to actually be able to, to kind of call. So, so for example, I think I mentioned this before, forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but with Matthew McFadden, um, on Howard's End, we had this sort of ongoing gag, that it, private gag, which was Margaret Schlegel is like this kind of evil genius where she's just trying to emasculate his character so that by the end, he's essentially just in a, pair, in, in, in a nappy dribbling because he just like, he doesn't know who he is anymore as a man. And she's just kind of out, you know, just smart at him. And so um, in order to kind of see this to its final kind of beautiful conclusion, the last day of filming where we filmed the scene where his character goes, did, did I do wrong? Because he's so confused by this point. Um, I got to work early and I put a potty training device on his toilet in his trailer. I put a diaper, a nappy in his costume pants, a pacifier, a dummy on his makeup station, nappy rash cream. And then I also got, uh, to make sure that any time he asked anyone for a cup of tea, that he was given a bib and a sippy cup. And uh, to, to, because he's the, just such a wonderful human being, he, he <laughs> turned up to the rehearsal with a sippy cup, the bib and his, and his dummy in his mouth and he was ready to go. Um, so anything that's like, and Emma Thompson does this as well. I think once she once said to me that she, when she was dressed as Nanny McPhee, she was uh, filming uh, on, and a studio and she knew that they were filming Clash of the Titans in the, ne in the next kind of warehouse along. So she turned up full Nanny McPhee to, to I think, to, to Liam Neeson, who was in his full God garb and just was just like, hey, <laughs> was kind of flirting with him as Nanny McPhee. And so I kind of, I love anything like that because that feels like in the spirit of creativity, but also being, being really silly, you know, that's kind of keeps us going. Because one thing, again, when I was younger, just feeling like I had to be in the character. And that's not always the case. Often I do my better work if I'm engaged with the people around me. And there's a, and I'm also feeling like if people are relaxed, they'll do better work. Um, if people are realizing that this is play, this is play, we're gonna try different things and you can't fail because we'll just go again. That that sort of spontaneity creates a really healthy working on set relationship. So um, if you've got any tips or any suggestions about what I can do to Tom, uh, send them my way. <laughs> You'll be a different one to get. He's, 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 he's pretty smart. He'll catch me in the act, I'm sure. Good to see you, Ben. Great. And we've just, I'm afraid, come to the end. We've got time for one more question. And Alana, I think you've lined yourself up to ask that. And then Tom, we'll go over back to Tom Hodgkinson, the editor of The Idler, to wind up. But I'm so sorry, everybody else who hasn't had time to ask a question. Um, Alana, what's your question? Hi, Haley. My name is Alana. Uh, my question is, what is your advice for people who have like a creative pathway and how to keep themselves like grounded and happy and continuing to do what they do and their passion, whether they're an actor, a makeup artist, an artist, or like someone who makes music, anything along the lines of like creativity mm. um it's a, it's a really good question to that i ask myself a lot sometimes you know i ask myself well, i need to keep myself in check as to why i'm doing what i'm doing um you know to to mention chad boseman again you know i i, I posted this this video that i saw on, on my on my instagram i saw him give a speech uh, at howard university where he talked about it's not about the job it's about 
a life of purpose. And so knowing that if you are a creative and you identify as a creative being that is going to dedicate your life to a creative life, that might not always be easy. It might not always be clear. It might not always be appreciated. <laughs> it might not always be paid. But if you know that deep down, deep within you, there is a calling for a creative life, then that is an impulse that, that we must validate and honor and respect for ourselves so that we, we know that we're working for work's sake and that we're putting work out into the world um, as an attempt to connect with other human beings. And I think, it's an, I think it's an honorable life, the creative life. I don't think it's easy. I think as an actor also, you have uh, you know, the, the added thing of kind of this, if you're successful, a byproduct of success can be a sort of fame or celebrity that can be very unsettling and very toxic and very damning to the creative soul, ironically. So, you know, one thing they don't talk about in, in, in drama school is they talk about how unlikely it is that you'll ever get a job and sustain it and make a living from it. What they don't say is if you are lucky enough to get continuous work, you will, your creative impulses might be threatened with um, this sort of weird public property that you become. And how do you navigate that? And so much of it is uh, seeking out the company of other creative minds and uh, having artistic integrity, reading books, looking at pieces of art, listening to music that help facilitate that voice, that help nourish that creative soul. I do sometimes say I do lots of journaling. Um, part of, you know, part of the things, one of the reasons why I do collages and make decoupage boards and vision boards is all that feels like I'm creating my view of the world to be one that is beautiful and that is artistic and that does, is an antidote to a lot of the hardness of the politics of the world and a lot of the pain of the world. And, um, you know, and I think just the sort of the quest and the search for a creative life and, um, and an acceptance of where you are today with it, knowing that it, it, you might not get the feedback you think the piece of work you wanted, or, but that's okay. You know, and it, there was a turning point for me when I really truly, it, it was only happened in the last couple of years, it was actually when I was doing a, a Shakespeare play, when I really gave myself permission to fail. And I, it, I was really okay that people might not like what I was doing or think that I was rubbish. I was really okay with that. It's not my business. I'm gonna do it anyway, because it's, it's my, the creative life that I want. So I'm just gonna do it anyway, because I'm doing it for the love of doing it. And, and that helps to, uh, I suppose, let go of the, the people-pleasing impulse or the need to feel validated or praised or you know, some sort of adoration, which is so fleeting anyway and, and, and unsustainable. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot there. I hope there's something you got out of it, but um, I, you know, I, I wish you all the best with it. I think it's living a creative life is truly, truly fulfilling and, and a noble one. So I wish you all the best with it, that you find the path and you navigate it for yourself in your own terms. Thank you, Haley. That's exactly what I needed to hear. And I just wanted to tell you that you were an inspiration and I hope I get to meet you in person one day. Oh. Like, forward from all of this instead of virtually and um I love all your work and I'm also a huge Peggy fan I have all my books here that I ordered <laughs> and I'm still yet to read oh, yeah thank you Anna. yeah I look forward to meeting you thank you Aww. thank you so much thank you all thank you all for your brilliant questions and I'm sorry so many of you haven't got to ask them Tom if you like to, and, and Haley, of course, thank you so very much, but that's really for Tom to, to do that part. Ah, that really is amazing, Haley. I, I could you see why you've got these, these crowds of um, brilliant young women who are um, looking up to you and taking inspiration from you. Um, and you really do combine this sort of um, philosophical reflection about what you do uh, with a sort of huge talent at the same time. Um, and a very, um, lots of beautiful words, a very beautiful person. I think we're very, very lucky to have had you with us for the last hour or so. Um, <laughs> and I'm sure everyone would like to give, give a quick round of applause. <laughs> on, on, on mute. Okay, thanks, Hayley, so much for coming. Good girl, come on. <laughs> they all come.
Um, and it's so, it's so nice to see everyone from all over the place and some, some younger folk too. Uh, <laughs> sometimes we're a bit dominated by the oldies in the idler evenings. Um, For yourself. <laughs> I'll just remind you that there is a uh, lovely interview we did with Haley a couple of years ago, somewhere on the idler website in the archive somewhere, and this issue may be around, I don't know. I have my latest copy here, see? I'm a genuine fan. I get this sent through my letterbox. Oh, you actually, uh, you actually subscribe. I do, of course. <laughs> well, yeah, thanks, Haley, for like, yeah, promote, promote our product too. That'd be really good. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, I, you know, I'm, I, 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 Um, oh. Someone got the Hoover out. They were like, okay, we're done. Oh. Yeah, I thought that was um, some experimental music we had lined up. Because <laughs> we have been looking okay. to some on guard music with people like Charlie Hazelwood. Maybe that was it, like it was Can or something. Um, but we, Hayley, uh, uh, I felt like I, I really sort of like put it down with the thing about the kittens in the middle. Um, and. Um, Life. That's, that's, <laughs> but um, I just wanted to mention uh, another quite another downer, which is uh, I mentioned at the beginning a, an academic friend of ours, David Graeber, um, who's the most brilliant writer um, and academic. Um, and he wrote a book called Debt, the First 5,000 Years. He wrote a book called Bullshit Jobs. Yeah. He's been right at the front of the Occupy movement. He's been right at the front of you know Black Lives Matter. And he's a Jewish working class uh, Manhattanite. Um, Victoria and I had dinner with him a couple of weeks ago and he, he died this week um, at the age of 59. So that's just uh, a bit of bad news to end on. Yeah, um, sorry. But also, you know, it sounds like what a legacy he leaves, you know, that's the most the thing about the work that he's putting out into the world that goes even beyond the short time that he was here with us. How lucky, how lucky, how, how lucky to have known him. It makes me want to go out and read his work now. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, that's that's very very true. Um, and what you were saying just now about the creative life, you know, I mean, he 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 has he gave so much, and um, it's all still there. You know, he'll he'll live forever in a way, or certainly for a generation. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, well, 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 you're so philosophical. This is absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for like um, cheering us all up and being so brilliant. Oh, unbelievable. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. For me, guys. <laughs> I'm going to go feed the cat. <laughs> yeah, go feed the cat. We're we're going to um uh we're going to play out with Anarchy in the UK by the Sex Pistols, yes. um which I think is a very cheerful song. And punk was all about you know um doing your own thing and uh, leading a creative life. Yes. And and that's what Anarchy in the UK is really really about. Amen. Thank you. Oh, so that's why I need to keep playing back. I'm still waiting for the song, song, song.